So thank you very much, Tim, for your kind introduction, and thank you for everyone being here. Essentially, since 2012, I've been volunteering full-time for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, which is an open project which has participants around the world. And if you haven't heard of it before, that's where I'm operating. Today, I'm going to be focusing on something that I wanted to talk about a long time, and it was inspired by a interview between Tim and one Stanislav Adamenko from 2006. And so I'm going to start off with that early. And this is something that people must appreciate, that by being open as we try to be, it's not necessarily that you feel you've discovered something. It's just that if it's never put into the open sphere, no, no one can even consider it as prior data and consider it in their own thinking. And when Tim is doing these interviews and these sessions, uh, I hope that you will understand at the end of this presentation how important it was that some of the most, um, uh, how should we say, uh, unusual things that some people may dismiss and can't believe at the time. Those are the things that turn out to be sometimes the most interesting things. And if you keep those things to yourself, then the science doesn't move forward because when someone sees those things in their own work, they, they also may reject them and not tell people forward. And so I, I'm going to start with this example. And then part way through the presentation, I'm going to give an example of something that was almost a throwaway comment by another researcher in this field, which has not been made public. It was in a private conversation in Russia in October in 2018. But I think it's incredibly fundamental. And if anyone has had a chance to look at my previous presentation, I talked about how uh, relic neutrinos and the synthesized equivalents, technologically synthesized equivalents, cold neutrinos, these microns to millimeters structures, their de Broglie wavelength, may be the explanation for gravity as we observe it. And the CERN theory group in 2010 published something along those lines. And that if you can cluster these into structures, which Shishkin claims is going on, then you can produce a wide range of effects which I believe are responsible for many of the most weird phenomena that people have observed over the decades. Uh, the title of the presentation is a Vibrations in the Steam Room. This is my hand in uh, the steam room at the swimming pool earlier today. And I'll come to the, the inspiration that I had in that room. And it, it was probably as many years ago as uh, 2018 when I was in this very same steam room and I did something. And I thought, oh, my God, that's probably how it's going on. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the interview section, I'm going to read here um, because there's several important things in there. Um, and uh, I, I've shown this slide a number of times. In fact, the first time I, I showed it in, to a big audience was in Sochi in 2018 to the Russian uh, Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Group. And so this is S. S. V. Adamenko and the Ion Eater. So we were studying the nuclear transformation products of exploded metal targets by secondary iron mass spectrometry using this particular device. We discovered a number of spots on the surface of several 99.98% pure copper accumulating screens in which no scope signals from secondary ions were recorded. Secondary ions are normally dislodged from the screen's surface and should have been present given the intense bombardment of the screen by uh, primary ions. These spots were areas with a transverse size of about 50 to 100 microns that looked like irregularly shaped black spots on the display. So for those that don't know, secondary iron mass spectrometry, you get something like, uh, I don't know, gold iron or something, and you, you, you fire that towards your sample, and it smashes off uh, ions or, or um, atoms on the surface, and they come up and they uh, go through a drift tube, and you get them detected, their mass numbers, and so you can work out what you've got in your particular uh, sample that you're looking at. 
Um, anyway, so, so basically the crux of our observation was the absence of secondary iron flux in the scope for the entire range of iron masses analysed by the device in the area of black spots. So basically there was no Mendeleev table ions uh, you know, that, that they could find. Anyway, it goes, in following the normal, process, proceed, normal procedures for inter interpreting the images of the iron microprobe, we can only conclude that in the case of these anomalous black spots, not only are they not composed of any known chemical elements, but they're also not composed of any type of previously undiscovered heavier element. In the case of our equipment, up to 480 atomic mass units, which is the boundary of the range of the device used. Our operators have been making observations of this kind for decades, and this was the first time they had encountered this type of anomaly. If it wasn't any type of known atom, then what could it possibly be? We obsessively searched all of the spec speciality literature for an answer, but did not find any, uh, any description of any similar phenomena ever being documented before these events. We noticed something else. Also, even stranger than the lack of secondary ions, we were subjecting the black spots to a heavy iron bombardment in an attempt to pick up a secondary signal when we realised that not only were we not seeing a secondary signal, but there was also a complete absence of signal from the primary ions in the beam of the microprobe. The ions that we bombarded the spot with simply seemed to have disappeared, quite literally, without a trace. At first, I refused to believe that this could even be possible, because the primary ions are reflective, scattered from any surface in such a great amount that the secondary image of these ions on the display is transformed always to a continuous green glow on the scope's viewing screen. This omnipresent background signal is the reason that the scope's display is automatically switched off after a period of time, to prevent screen burn from the primary ions. As improbable as it may sound, the absence of reflective primary ions from the surface of the black spot must indicate that the primary ions arriving at the spot surface were captured by it. In another attempt to get the signal from the spot surface, the operator gradually scanned the whole dynamic range of masses of secondary ions accessible to the device. This was performed a while after the primary beam was switched off. While slowly turning the knob of the device, the operator noticed a flickering spot with a decreasing intensity near 433 atomic mass units. This flicker was positioned inside the black spot and occupied a small part of its area. And several seconds after the beginning of the observation, the brightness of the flickering spot decreased to zero, i.e. the luminous spot against the background of the black area disappeared. We repeated this new experiment by switching the beam on again for several minutes and again switching it back off. The image of the flickering spot at mass of 433 AMU arose with the same initial brightness and again disappeared from view within several seconds. In both cases, the boundaries of the black spot were invariable. After repeating this power cycling observation routine 12 times, we established that the initial luminous intensity of the 433 AMU spot after a pause was proportional to the duration of the pause and the decrease in luminosity intensity as it faded from view had an exponential character. During the analysis of another black spot, with the use of the ionic microprobe, the operator observed a pattern similar to that described above, but different in that the luminosity arose not inside the black spot, but instead occurred in a non-uniform manner along the length of the black spot's winding boundary. So, um, here you have this black spot. This is this sort of uh, luminous green area that you could imagine is coming from the... Um, uh, primary ions that they were talking about on the phosphors of the detection screen, the viewing screen. And down here is when they switch the uh, uh, device off and they see this uh, glow from this 433 uh, down to the uh, um, g going down exponential. Uh, so after four seconds, it's dimmed down. It's always in the same place in the center of the black spot. 
as obviously atomic mass 63 is a copper isotope and so that's what's glowing there and obviously it's a 99.98 percent copper sample so what does the iron eater tell us there is a long-lived structure that was presenting as a black spot 50 to 100 micrometers in size no known secondary ions were detected following uh, the exposure to the primary ions primary ions not detected either so it must have been consuming them detected a decaying glow from the center of the spot something uh, of something that has a mass of 433 amu so um we can from what it's saying there it's essentially consuming the matter uh, and it is potentially producing something which is not in the Mendeleev table and it's kicking that out uh, and it's always in the same spot and it decays so obviously it, 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 it has a load of material that's descending into it and for whatever reason in the center of this spot uh, uh, these 433 AMU things are able to uh, present themselves and uh, so it seems to be doing some capture and assembly. So how do Adamenko uh, build, so how did this should say, Adamenko build an iron eater? So he has a, uh, has, he has a plasma discharge unit uh, and he has a plasma switch in it. I, I, I've done this in detail. It's in his book. If people are interested, unfortunately, it's a, it's a hugely expensive book. It's like... 170 pounds in digital version or something but it is worth it actually uh, it's a lot of work it's uh, this book controlled nuclear synthesis here uh, and it's 700 pages of uh, nuclear transmutation goodness um, uh, anyway to cut a long story short uh, he has a metal target which is a small little probe which has a radius at the end a spherical sort of it's like a half of a pill and a focal point and he discharges uh, I think it's something like 300 joules or no more than 700 joules I think 300 joules um, into um, the end of this target at one tenth of C so it's a relativistic discharge and uh, one of these things will look like this afterwards uh, and it's kind of like blown out and you can see that something happened in the center here and he says that this forms a electronucleus macrocluster that there is some sort of electron structure that's able to collapse the matter and so forth and then you get uh, this explosive event and then he has what's called an accretion disk now here is one sample uh, a couple of samples from different angles and uh, this is another copper 99.99 percent here and you can see here 71 mass uh, this here is uh, zinc and uh, uh, the zinc on there is 71 mass percent so you can say that maybe a copper isotope accepted a proton and went through and produced uh, zinc and it's interesting that you get almost all of the mass uh, as the transformed element in spots and I've argued that this is because you get coherent structures and they're at a resonant intensity and when they fail uh, most of the matter is at a particular element and so for instance here there's a spot here where it's a 52.7 percent gold and 45 percent copper so this was skewed towards gold and uh, this one has a lot of lanthanides you've got uh, neodymium presidymium cerium lanthanum uh, so here uh, so, so this, this is what you see you see bulk transmutation uh, from a particular uh, element to another and so typically he would have this copper probe here which was the anode and then the accretion disk and this is what the accretion disk would look like and so the the anode would sit in the middle of this poking up through and you get this explosions uh, uh, coming out here uh, so you can see all the action definitely happened in the center and again, you've got uh, some elements with high concentrations of um, uh, synthesized elements here. This one's 76.3% gold, 74.7% um, uh, gold. And it's, you know, it's, some people say that like um, 
gold is just a lot of nucleons strapped onto the outside of a nucleus of, of copper, um, you know, copper, silver, gold. And in fact, uh, you know, when I bought my uh, nugget uh, from Alaska to make uh, my wife and my wedding ring here, um, this is nearly entirely copper, sorry, entirely uh, silver and gold, uh, this Alaskan nugget. And I, I have the SEM of the nugget here. And it is interesting that natural nuggets are found with a, a lot of elements in this particular uh, column of the periodic table. So uh, there is a school of thought to say it does cluster onto the outside. So anyway, you've got a range of elements here that were not in the original pure material in any measurable sense. And here's a comment from the book. It says, after five years of continuous research of various samples accumulating screens on which the matter was precipitated from exploding targets made chem of chemically pure met metals, magnesium, aluminium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, magnesium, uh, manganese rather, iron, co cobalt, so forth, all the way up to bismuth, it has been established that the correlation coefficients between the relative prevalence of chemical elements in the products of the target explosion and their concentration in impurities of the materials used in the uh, construction of the setup and the residual atmosphere of its vacuum system vary from that to that. But basically, in other words, there is no relation between the element composition of products of the target matter transformation and that of the in initial target or materials used in manufacturing the setup details. So uh, essentially, th this work proved uh, over this two, three, four, five year period uh, before the interview with Tim uh, that they could take pretty much any uh, uh, matter uh, in the form of a metal, a conductive substance, uh, fire a lot of electrons at it, uh, potentially through a, a proton rich environment, and it would synthesize most of the elements, in fact, all of the elements in the periodic table. And according to the statement at the top of this presentation, elements that are outside of the periodic table. The above facts had provided in 2001 to 2003 the first grounds to say that the experiments carried out at the Electrodynamics Laboratory Proton 21, we have succeeded in implementing and learning how to reliably reproduce under laboratory conditions a microscopic analogue of the natural physical phenomena which accounts for the explosive nuclear synthesis resulting in the creation of the full range of stable isotopes, stable isotopes, of all chemical elements found in nature and it seems to be an energy source for supernova flares, as well as possibly a number of other astrophysical processes of, a, of the pulse nature. This process, which can be reliably reproduced, is self-sufficient in energy terms. The energy required to trigger the process is about 10 to the 4 times lower than the whole work of the process on transforming the matter plus the total energy of the particle and radiation streams it produced. So there we go. Uh, this produces net energy. It can deal with radioactive waste, he's saying down the bottom here. And so these are all the things that uh, what I believe coherent matter, uh, um, nuclear transmutations can do. And in the words of Matsumoto, it's uh, electro-nuclear collapse. Okay, so... So the process for cluster formation is to create the conditions for uh, magnetic charges to form. And we're going to talk about uh, the things that are actionable to do with that. Capture them and uh, the actionable items on that. Drive their aggregation. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, actionable items on that and uh, feeding them. Well, uh, I can deal with the last one first. Uh, the food for these things are essentially any bosons, but in the right circumstances, electrons, uh, ions and uh, atoms, which may not necessarily be uh, bosons. And uh, the properties of these things, uh, they seem to stay locked into place, uh, it would appear from uh, the work of a Adamenko. But I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, the fact that um, uh, uh, Kenneth Redford Shoulders, who developed uh, the name Exotic Vacuum Objects as part of his research studying uh, John Hutchison. He said these things can stay in metals uh, indefinitely until he deliberately blows them up by exciting them. Okay, and uh, I'm daring to say here that they are quantum locked. They are they are locked into their relationship with the matter that surrounds them. 
um, they have an intense boundary like uh, like an event horizon. So I'm going to, I've given exa many examples over a period of time, but I, I will talk about that also a little bit today. Um, so yeah, it has an intense boundary, and this is very important to the, the, the discussion, main discussion point of this presentation. So uh, having an event horizon is, is that almost nothing happens outside of this event horizon, and everything happens inside the event horizon. And so if you're outside, you're, you're safe, it's not a problem, and uh, you go across this uh, unseen wall and uh, boundary uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you could be torn apart. Now, there may be this drift area, and you might like to think of that as the irons being shot at this black spot, and then, you know, it's, it, it's emitting these 433 AMU uh, emissions over a period of time. And so that you, you, you've got these particles, they've been caught, they're drifting in and then they're being assembled, assembled into these heavier ions. Can be excited to blow up, uh, producing subquanta or self-similar fragments. Okay, and um, what I'm saying here is, again, referring back to Ken Shoulders, they can sit in the metal indefinitely, but in, then if you overexcite them in a way, they can blow up. And this is going to be very important to the technology and the testimony from the technology, which I am going to be uh, concluding and discussing uh, with respect to this um, vibrations in the steam room. These traveling subfragments can disrupt matter as they travel. And this is the action of strange radiation. We're gonna show a couple of examples of that. I did a lot of it work in the previous presentation on that. So is this a unique finding? The unique finding of Stanislav Adamenko and the team of scientists working there for up maybe as much as six years in the former Soviet uh, isotopic factory outside Kiev in the Ukraine. No, it is not. This is in Matsumoto's uh, paper that was published in Fusion Technology in September 1992 and this was in uh, heavy water, deuterium oxide, and uh, he's got these black spots here and he's saying figure one shows spherically symmetrical traces spherically symmetrical traces so you're just seeing a cross section here but it's actually spherical with different diameters these traces were recorded inside the nuclear emulsions so that they can easily be separated from the patches that are produced on the surface of the emulsions during the film developing process all of the traces consist of two regions. The inner region is almost completely black, but the outer region, tiny black dots, are radiatively distributed. This suggests that some radiation and or particles might have come out from the center region. Okay, so you, you, you're looking at a slice of a structure that's observed inside emulsions. Now, what, what do I mean by nuclear emulsions? Takaaki Matsumoto, Dr. Matsumoto, was a nuclear radiation monitoring and detection expert, and he um, was an expert in nuclear emulsions, and so he knew what he was looking at, and he knew when something was a, uh, a processing error, a film processing error, because sometimes when you develop film, you get these little marks and imperfections on the surface of the film. So that's what he's referring to there. He's saying that this is inside the polymer, uh, of the um, emulsion okay another one here from September 1992 but in a 1993 paper that I've just put here figure seven a tiny black hole was expected to be generated from the collapse of multiple neutrons collapse of multi no, multiple neutrons this is something similar to what is later being discussed uh, in a 2003 paper with uh, Vladimir Vysotsky uh, about the uh, work of Stanislav Adamenko et al that might be produced from massive nuclei, such as the host metal and the electrolyte. So in the case of Matsumoto, he was doing explosive cold fusion using uh, a, a, a electrolysis. So he had a water type, in this case it was D2O, heavy water, some form of electrolyte, maybe potassium carb carbonate or potassium hydroxide or something, or sodium hydroxide. And he was electrolyzing that and sometimes he was causing an explosion. And so uh, he, he was creating a high 
uh, short duration transient event. So it's quite similar, but obviously with uh, much more simple technology to that used at Proton 21 labs uh, and observing something similar produced like this. And you can see it really, it's all speckling. You have to imagine that this is a spherical object. So if you cut, cut the, the um, emulsion, you know, in half, you would see this in the middle of the emulsion as well as seeing something almost identical from the top with this kind of radiation coming out here. It says, the evaporation of tiny black holes has been successfully observed in heavy water. Figure 7a, this one here, uh, shows Hawking radiation at the evaporation of tiny black hole, which is similar to the traces observed in the previous experiment with heavy water. Now, what does he mean by Hawking radiation? Hawking, before he died, I think he uh, had something to say about whether he, he still believed in the event horizon, whatever. What we can see from the video, uh, cap the captures from the uh, um, the device, this secondary ion mass spectrometry of uh, Adamenko, is that something was going in, something was being assembled and progressively emitted. And it was uh, energetic particles. And so at the very least, they were observing 433, but the device is not necessarily set up to detect uh, mesons coming out, muons coming out, high-speed electrons, high-speed photons and such it's it's there to detect these ions coming out so it's it's working in a different way so he could be right in saying that the, the material is uh, torn up now from uh, the work of uh, shoulders he's saying when it absorbs uh, matter uh, the energy is released in the form of uv uh, extreme uv and soft x-rays typically up to uh, two killer electron volts in the condensation process and you can have uh, one ion captured per uh, uh, 100,000 electrons, okay? So one would imagine there's a lot of electrons in here. In the case of Matsumoto, though, uh, he was saying that it, it, you are producing uh, what are called itons. Now, what is an iton? An iton is a, uh, a positron and an electron bound together with a... Uh, a neutrino. Now, if you have a positron and an electron bound together, you have positronium, okay, which is a, a kind of structure itself. And positronium is bound together. What's it bound together with? I don't know. But in the case of Matsumoto, he's saying a positron and an electron are bound together with this neutrino. And if you can imagine um, an electron uh, cluster collapsing, Apparently, according to Matsumoto's book, which you can get from remoteview.icu, we've got over half of that published now, so you can download it with all the papers in there and his uh, steps to discovery of electronuclear collapse. When, when this thing is collapsing, it polarizes. Let, let's say you've just got a proton, the, the nucleus of uh, a protium, uh, you know, a monoatomic hydrogen nucleus. As it's compressing the... Uh, nucleus, it polarizes the uh, proton such that you get an emission of a positron and you get the emission of a neutrino. And so then, if you take your monoatomic hydrogen, which is normally a proton and an electron, and this process goes forward, you then have a neutron in the center and you have a positron, an electron, and a neutrino. And the positron and the electron and the neutrino come, become into a bound state, and that forms the iton, which is a neutral particle, okay? And a neutron in the core, which is also neutral. So you have a structure at the very basic level which is able to pass into matter and transmute it. Now, any other nucleus in the periodic table has more neutrons and protons. And in fact, it, up, up to calcium-40, like calcium-40 is like... 20 neutrons, 20 protons, it's dec alpha, it's, it's, it's half and half. But even then, you've got 20 electrons, 20 protons, and 20 neutrons. The 20 protons can produce 20 uh, positrons and 20 um, uh, neutrinos. You, get, you then you end up with uh, uh, the, these 20 um, uh, itons, and that forms a cluster around your uh, 40 neutrons in the core. So any neutrons stay a neutron, and any, any protons uh, take part in producing the itons, and the itons form the clusters. And it's interesting because S.V. Adamenko observed 
that in some of their experiments they got emissions of heavy nuclei with 5,000 to 7,000 AMU emitted. 5,000 to 7,000 AMU. And somehow these things are flying out of their experiments and remaining stable long enough uh, for them to interact with other matter. And if you've got 7,000 neutrons interacting with other matter, well, it's going to cause a lot of transmutation, isn't it? If you get electronuclear collapse where the, uh, the itonic shell is able to collapse further. Now, the itonic uh, mesh, this shell that's surrounding it, this is what Matsumoto uh, said is what ball lightning is. And he said that this is a more detailed description of what the shell of an exotic vacuum object is. And he agreed that what he was doing in 2001, he agreed that essentially the, he, they were talking about the same thing, uh, exotic vacuum objects and, uh, and uh, itonic clusters. Uh, but the, the, Ken Shoulders was not a theoretician. He said often that he's not into theory. He just described what he saw and could repeat what he saw every day of the week okay whereas uh, that which is important in science one might like to say <laughs> okay so um now whether um matsumoto is correct i, I don't know but uh, certainly what he's saying produces something that's neutral and can do the things that were observed by uh, um stanislav adamenko now Matsumoto didn't stop there. In a paper in 1993, he published this. Figure 7b through 7f, these ones here, shows the typical feature of the black hole. The conic shape, materials seem to spout energetically from the bottom of the cone. Right? So uh, he has these cones here, and you get these structures coming out. And whether this is... He said that you had a white hole and a black hole, and that th this did this material... Uh, organization so here, here this is a white hole and a black hole and, and so you're actually rather than looking at top down these are slightly more um, these are exploded black holes or something something like that it's, it's in this paper from 1993 but the interesting thing for me is that this particular structure uh, he's often saying that it synthesizes a lot of carbon and I've discussed uh, in many presentations why carbon comes out it's because it's triple alpha alpha is the most stable sort of grouping of nucleons and uh, many synthesized elements become alpha conjugate nuclei and if you make alpha it floats away if you make beryllium 8 it decays to 2 4 alpha it blows away uh, there's helium uh, so the first stable element that comes out of these systems when it's uh, doing electronuclear collapse and electronuclear regeneration is carbon and so uh, you see these carbon marks on here now um, this is on the fracture sample from uh, John Hutchison uh, in, in a presentation called Hutchison Effect Magic Incarnate in, in this YouTube link. You can go and see a big discussion about this in relation to Matsumoto. But here's one of these structures in th three dimensions. So this is caught inside a, a, um, an emulsion or on the surface of an emulsion. This is in three dimensions. And the interesting thing is, uh, and I've got the whole thing, and it's, it's, it's almost identical shape. <laughs> and funnily enough, the, the actual areas here are almost identical in, in terms of their positioning. So th th there must be something very regular in what happens when these things blow up. They must happen in a very particular way. And the interesting thing is that the clear areas here are diamond and the strands along the edges are magnesium. And the interesting thing about magnesium is it's double carbon. Okay. So uh, out of our black hole, we have carbon predominantly coming and double carbon on the, uh, the ridges, okay? So, um, uh, and the thing is that these, produ th these structures produce solitons. Uh, these are like donuts of two different types, uh, a, a, a predominantly north pseudo-magnetic monopole and a south magnetic monopole. Uh, and in the same presentation, we, they can produce these flux loops and uh, so we'll have a, a north or a south here and a north or a south here and material is swept between the two and at the point of the boundary where they meet uh, it's like a it's like a phallico soliton like you have in a swimming pool there's kind of some disturbance and things bleed out and so uh, we've got an iron ball that bleeds out and something here um, uh, it's absolutely you have to go and look at that presentation it's a much more complicated discussion but here we have what I believe is um, the pit created by a, a black hole that would be in this core here. And when I say a black hole, it's a thing that's 
It has a vortical structure that goes into it in a pole. And it has a space which it's kind of almost quantum locked into the paramagnetic aluminium. And the magnesium, actually this has magnesium and, and uh, aluminium in it, probably. And uh, so you, you have uh, something that's in the this area here. And both magnesium and uh, aluminium are um, uh, paramagnetic. So it can bind to those nucleus, these structures. So uh, are there other ways of doing this? Well, the, the surest way to create these structures and the quickest way to kill yourself if you want to get loaded up with transported ions that blow up inside your body uh, is to use a hydrosonic pump or a cavitator. And this is uh, the one of Alexander Shishkin and his colleagues at Dubna Science City, north of Moscow in Russia. And it's basically an industrial electric motor here. And then inside this structure, it has a series of keyways uh, that are radially arranged. And so you get intense cavitation in there. And uh, this, uh, in a presentation which I'm going to just drop into here, uh, which is a new type of penetrating radiation, he talks about the other ways that they've created these magnetic monopole-like structures. So I'm going to drop out of this now, and I'm going to go to that presentation for you uh, to look at. So this is the presentation. Uh, you can go and look at it on our YouTube channel. You can go and see the original Russian presentation and my translation of it. But this is a new type of penetrating radiation, uh, Alexander Shishkin, and this is from October 2018. Okay. So he talks about the fact that this, this type of uh, high energetic radiation, which is often 120 kilo electron volts, uh, sort of seemingly when it blows up, uh, and, uh, and it's much more energetic than uh, characteristic X-rays, were observed by Charles uh, Glover Barkler um, in the 1910s, and after he won the Nobel Prize in, the, in, in 1917 for discovery of characteristic X-rays, he literally spent the rest of his life trying to work out what J radiation was. Okay, and other, many other authors investigated this phenomenon of J radiation. Uh, when it came to post-1989, uh, many people in the cold fusion field observed these emissions of 120 kilo electron volts. And in this uh, interview here from uh, 1996 with one uh, Martin Fleischmann uh, that our project is named after, um, he talks about these uh, not soft x-rays, these uh, things. And he also says here, um, uh, if you have got high energy x-rays coming out, and this goes back to Stanislav Spack, lots of people say, well, it, it's soft x-rays. But soft x-rays would never get out of the cells. Would never get out of the cells. Uh, and so, so that had to be blah, blah, blah. So essentially, are these coherent x-rays? What do they do? Okay, it is coherent matter. It is these structures. But he, interestingly, in this uh, interview, uh, with Christopher P. Tinsley in Infinite Energy. Uh, they, the, the only question talking about antigravity is the only time that it goes Fleischmann, Fleischmann, and there's a dot, dot, dot between the two things. And uh, he said he was, they were re researching four different things at the time that they were doing uh, uh, cold fusion. Uh, one was cold fusion, one was the behavior of electrons in metals, including uh, room temperature superconductivity, and another one was blah, 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 we're not going to mention that. And, and then there was this whole discussion about antigravity, which they kind of edited out, it would seem. Anyway. Um, if I mentioned this maybe before in the previous presentation that Simon E. Schnoll uh, published this book, which you can get. Uh, it's from studying papers from 1951 to 2008, and it's on cosmo fact physical factors in random processes. And in the conclusion of this book, uh, which, I, like I say, you can download for free, um, it's in conclusion, Simon Schnoll argues that all random processes in chemistry, biophysics, physics, including fluctuation of the decay of radioactive rate of radioactive elements measured at the same time in the same place are strictly correlated with each other. Based on this analysis, Schnoll, as well as other researchers, for example, Parkamov, Baurov, etc., concluded that there exists a certain cosmophysical factor, agent, which actively influences virtually all processes occurring on the Earth and in space. And this here is the uh, um, relic neutrino flux, which uh, was referred to by um, uh, Tesla in his uh, 1880s, 1890s work as these infinitesimally small corpuscles that come from the cosmos rather than coming from the sun. 
Anyway, they call, Shishkin calls it magnetotoro electrical radiation, and he believes that this is the agent. And uh, when the, he ran these experiments with that cavitator I showed you earlier, <clears throat> He observed these what they call birdies and if you can imagine a mushroom sliced in half this is the structure and I talked about this in my previous presentation and uh, when some guy analyzed these uh, photographic film plates and he said well have you got an iron bar uh, and bar on bombarder what's going on because they saw these pits underneath the birdies in the film and uh, these micro micro craters and these birdies they were able to create in these different ways. The first one I've already given you, from hydrodynamic generator HDG, from revolving bodies made of various materials, titanium, cadmium, etc. Now, why is this important? This is important because of people using spinning material to create anti-gravity. I'm saying that these things are relating to uh, shielding of gravity or, or removing the effect of gravity on other bodies. I'm saying you can aggregate them into large self-similar macro clusters. They will affect all kinds of things that I gave in my previous presentation like light, like uh, radioactive decay, uh, like the crystallization of metals. Plus they will also cause forces or a perceived force and I talked about um, the work uh, of, of Xu Wenju from 1988 to 1999 and of Morris Alai uh, that's on the NASA's website from the I think 1954 where they observed the Foucault pendulum in the case of the latter author uh, changing during three body alignments and in the case of Xu Wenju he saw a sideways movement in a metal plate during a three body alignment and this I believe is the pressure form of gravity and the pressure is created by the superfluid superconducting uh, condensate that pervades the entire universe which is relic neutrinos uh, and uh, uh, anyway so a spinning body so you might have a number of, I think the Chukhanov uh, uh, device uh, is a spinning body I think many people have referred to spinning bodies these structures come out of things that you spin quickly and I've got permission now to translate the work of Alexander Shishkin into English and I will be putting that in the next months or two onto remoteview.icu if you want to follow that work. But he took things as sim these cones of metals and spanned them at something like 5000 RPM and this strange radiation is emitted. Okay. From materials irradiated with gamma radiation. So just shooting gamma radiation at something is able to uh, uh, produce these uh, magnetic monopole-like structures. Uh, John Hutchison used some uranite in his experiments. He always had this big lump of uranite. And so that will have cesium-137, uh, one example of a gamma emitter. And that will emit gamma rays. So he had seed structures in order to create these things uh, that could uh, produce his effect. From gamma sources specifically, rather than uh, just from a gamma radiation. So you, you can create gamma radiation by taking a high speed electron and passing it through a conversion target. Or you can create it by, from actual gamma sources, from nuclear gamma. So co cobalt 60 here and 137 cesium. So you would have get, got these sort of things. Uh, from uh, Fukushima uh, in abundance and so the idea that you would have these magnetic monopoles binding to the oxygen producing the weird glow above uh, um, uh, Chernobyl and uh, some weird events at, at uh, Fukushima is not surprising because you can produce these structures by applying a high voltage pulse of plus or minus 590 volts on an x-ray film in an opaque uh, package so that's one way of doing it Corona streamer discharge. Okay, so Corona, this is very, very important to the technology that I will be discussing uh, that's relevant with the, um, the uh, uh, vibrations in a steam room because a Corona was uh, used, a Corona discharge was used in that technology. But of course, a Corona streamer discharge is what you get uh, in a Tesla ball. Okay, so a Tesla ball in theory. Uh, if it's at, at the right energy levels should produce a quanta of these strange radiation okay uh, and these two generated uh, type of generators I don't know what they are actually and, and, and essentially he says with his device he calculated that uh, one hour exposure would 
damage uh, red blood cells from the number of greys produced uh, and uh, it would basically red blood cell damage and uh, damage to the, the um, uh, uh, genetic material in white blood cells and so essentially he's saying that uh, one hour exposure to his cavitator would kill a man and uh, uh, um, Leclerc and his partner with their cavitation device that produced every element in the periodic table they also observed strange radiation tracks uh, away from their device and they almost killed themselves in a uh, one or two hour experiment okay so uh, be careful when you're doing these experiments um, weird effects and uh, can occur around anti-gravity craft uh, as well as uh, technology that relies on these phenomena Think things like time distortion uh, anything that uses a transistor will start cease to work very effectively um, if you get within the event horizon or within this sort of um, kind of boundary around the event horizon you need to be careful with that um, now there's an, a note at the end here um, Yuzhi Bajatov, uh, who sadly departed, probably because he was exposed to this radiation for too much uh, time, uh, he says that there is a way to protect yourself uh, with uh, a fluoroplastic plate. So, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, PTFE or, or uh, boron. And uh, the thickness of the sheet of glass uh, must be two centimeters thick. And other authors like Sh Shoulders and Shishkin um, are suggesting thin layers uh, of conductor and insulator, say mylars, my, metallized mylar sheet. I build them out of aluminium and cellophane, uh, uh, alternate layers and so on. Boron obviously is, an, is a neutron absorber. So if you've got something with 5,000 to 7,000 neutrons, it's probably good to have that there. Um, <laughs> and uh, fluoroplastic, I, I believe that fluorine is a good fuel for this. And so it causes a bit of a disruption to the things as they're flying through the air. And so um, that's the way that it interacts with that. Okay, so this is the point that I want to add in here from Shishkin, now we've been talking about him, that he said in a private conversation to me in 2018. He says, after a while, my cavitator stopped producing strange radiation. In order to get it to produce it again, I had to physically move it to a different part of the lab. After a while, my cavitator stopped producing strange radiation. In order to get it to produce it again, I had to physically move it to a different part of the lab. So, what we know from the work of um, S.V. Adamenko is we've got something that's locked into the metal. We know from shoulders that these things can stay in metal indefinitely. We know from, and I've shared this in many presentations, uh, we know from Matsumoto, these structures grew on crystal boundaries and the eight spherical sections out of the uh, material. This was observed by John Hutchison as early as 1979. Spherical sections inside a piece of metal were consumed. Okay, And we have observed this in our own Vega experiments last year and shared this widely. And we can see the whole process occurring on the macro scale and we've showed how it grows in the crystal boundaries and it eats out these sections, does the transmutation and, and so forth. And so this is very, very repeatable. But what we have shown in many of our Vega experiments, what Matsumoto showed in uh, 1990 in his paper on his palladium deuterated uh, rods, the material that's eaten in those, and, and other authors, is that it, it, it eats out to an area and then it completely stops. Like nothing gets eaten beyond, it's like a, it's like a perfect boundary. And we've actually created things uh, in uh, Henk's work where we've got a, a structure that's 10 millimeters across and it's completely cut copper. It's completely cut copper. Now, if it was a thermal effect, the copper would melt and, and, and so on because it's a very, very conductive, thermally conductive metal. But the fact that you have a, a coherent matter structure and on the boundary layer, it eats everything. And then outside the boundary layer, it does nothing. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. And so if you can imagine that you are producing this uh, 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 clusters in the aluminium in that structure, if we go back to it, so for instance here, um, if we go back here, this um, 
is producing a, an area around it where this flux of relic neutrinos from the cosmos is being sucked in and aggregated into these structures. And Shishkin says, uh, in fact, if I go back to his presentation, I, mi I missed that, so let me just go back to his presentation because there's one, one point uh, we missed here. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Um, a string vortex soliton is an ordered vortex structure of cold neutrinos since the interaction of string vortex soliton with radioactive isotopes changes the decay characteristics of these isotopes. Okay, so cold neutrinos are the technological equivalent of relic neutrinos or they could be relic neutrinos. So let's go back to our slide here. So he's saying that this device produces this emission of these uh, string vortex solitons, these neutral black evos uh, in the parlance of, of uh, Ken Shoulders, and that they go into X-ray film. But if he runs it in the same place too long, it stops working. And this was observed by uh, um, uh, Alexander Parkamov as well. And so he literally has to get this device and move it physically to another part of his lab and turn it on again for it to start producing the strange radiation on the x-ray film okay so this is consistent with the three body alignment effects where you get a sideways pressure because these things are partially reflected and refracted by solid bodies and they're gravitationally lensed they interact with neutrinos with gravity and the weak force and therefore by proxy with the electrons um and so as it as it rains down as for instance you've got like Betelgeuse shooting out a load of these relic neutrino flux towards or lensing it towards the sun and then the sun is re lensing that as a, as, a, as a lens module towards the, the, the moon and then it's wrapping around the moon there is stuff coming down which is of a higher density around the outside of the moon and then on the inside it's getting shadowed and all life uses this all random processes use this all matter use this okay and so You've got a higher amount on the outside and it's pressure gravity. You've got pushing in from the outside. And that's why your Morris Elias in 1954 on the NASA website has a Foucault pendulum that uh, moves out of sync when uh, it's in uh, three body alignment. And that's why you have this sideways movement, this sideways movement on the um, plane uh, by Xu Wenju. And so you can have, th this, this is the thing about a coherent condensate st structure is you can have two bosons or uh, um, composite bosons occupying the same space-time, and that is a Bose-Einstein condensate. But you can also have Googleplex, okay? You can have a Googleplex, and they're still part of the same condensate, okay? They're still acting as one a coherent body, but in some places, it's more, more alike than others. And this actually occurs with the Earth, and the sun because these structures are gravitationally lensed and you get a neutrino sphere around the sun and you get a neutrino sphere around the earth okay so where it's denser and the reason things germinate in certain parts of the month the thing the reason why seeds like to germinate in the spring is because nature knows that we are the the side of the earth that's in its spring is going into a denser flux of relic neutrinos this same condensate but there's a denser flux and all life is using it to transmute elements to do work within it okay and this is some of the work from simon schnob and so we know we can absorb this stuff and so if we're shielding it with the moon we get a sideways movement and if we're capturing it by having a spinning body which can include a re-entrant jet from a cavitating bubble, you are going to be aggregating these things from the environment. There's going to be a lower amount of them inside here, and there's going to be a higher amount of them outside, and you're going to get diffusion from the outside to the inside. Now, these things don't see normal matter like you or I. They don't see things like um, normal gases do. So when you have a vacuum vessel... There's always these things moving in and out like it doesn't care how good your vacuum is. It's going in and out. 
Now, if you have an electrical discharge in a vacuum and maybe a magnetic pinch, pulsed pinch on there, like the Varchaev devices, it's going to be condensing these structures, these relic neutrinos in there. Okay, and then there's going to be a depletion in the environment around it. And therefore, after a period of time, there won't be sufficient to produce these relic neutrino condensates, these uh, key structures for forming the ball lightning, for forming the exotic vacuum objects, for forming the ectons, for forming all these different names that different authors have given exactly the same thing. <laughs> because they do, because they, they think they've discovered it first. And so um, this for me here is probably the most uh, important comment I've got today, but it's definitely not the last. You, you may or may not be happy to hear that um, <laughs> because we're going to get on to the actual point. This is the background. So I want to say it again. After a while, my cavitator stopped producing strange radiation. In order to get it to produce it again, I had to physically move it to a different part of the lab. Okay, And this could explain why certain people's low energy nuclear reaction experiments don't work in certain parts of the Earth, even in the same time of year, or sometimes only work in the spring or sometimes only work in phases of the moon, because there is a different flux of relic neutrinos, and the parameter space in their particular experiment might not be flexible enough to continue working with a lower flux. They might need a higher flux to, to initiate, because you have to get these clusters to a certain cl strength uh, before you can get an electronuclear collapse. That is why you want to be technologically producing these, and that's the whole book with, uh, 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 that's the whole point about uh, relativistic discharges, uh, disruptive discharges like uh, Tesla used with his dis disruptive discharge generator. Uh, cavitation is ex incredibly intense energy, highly localized. And so you get these incredible temperatures, incredible temperature, anything over a thousand degrees, matter colliding together will synthesize cold relic neutrino, uh, um, uh, neutrinos and anti neutrinos that can start clustering to form these processes. Because so cavitation is almost the fastest way to do this. Okay, so. I'm now coming to the work of Suhas Raukar. He was trying to mill off-the-shelf particles to produce an energy generator, and he was trying to uh, get them down to a target size of five microns. After milling process, he would des desiccate these and grade them to five microns or less. The resulting particles would be placed into reactor cores, and then he used greater than one megahertz vibration of these particles in corona discharge. Remember what I said about corona discharge? We've got vibration here. We've got corona discharge. We've got something that was cavitating and we've got metal particles. Note what he said here. In his reactor, if he didn't corona discharge but caused a spark, the core would blow up. It would blow up. So, cavitation of metal in water, this makes the charges, uh, the magnetic uh, charges, via cavitation and resonant modes. Re what am I talking about, resonant modes? Well, I think probably the, the, the best way to talk about that is cymatics. Every, I don't really need to go into cymatics, you all know what I'm talking about. Okay, and so it, it almost doesn't matter what your structure of your plate is. Uh, it will set up some resonant modes. Now. These things, this, this is a key point. So let's look at this structure here. These things like to live on a surface. So they like to form in surface boundaries. But if you add sound, then, for instance, if you've got iron or you have aluminium, for instance, you want to make an anti-gravity device using aluminium plates, okay, and you're using discharges which produces static electricity which gives you a lot of charge separation and then you're spinning those plates which are going to allow you to get towards uh, producing uh, uh, these uh, uh, clusters and then you are vibrating it what you're doing is these magnetic monopole pseudo monopole structures that are bound to the paramagnetic aluminium are bounced and they're bounced and they form on the antinodes, where there's no bouncing going on. Now, we've done this every day of the week in a $35 experiment. You can go and find out how to do A five-year-old can do it, and it's called Ultra. You use a, a ultrasonic domestic uh, cleaner uh, for, you, you can get it off Amazon, have it delivered in a couple of days, and you can transmute elements using aluminium and water and sound, okay? You get the cavitation, you get the, the charge separation, 
and uh, you get the resonant modes and the resonant modes appear in almost instantaneously. We've called it all on camera and it's all shared and you synthesize elements. And it's because you get this, in my view, these charge clusters forming and you get the charge separation, the intense energy localization, the resonant energy localization at, at the nodes and antinodes. And you then get this uh, aggregation and you get these intense magnetic vortices and soliton pairs, uh, phallic soliton uh, structures. And th this is what is going on. If you have an aluminium plate and you're spinning it and then you have magnets on there, the magnets will do this. They will create vortex pairs. They will create induction effects. And the vortex pairs, because the relic neutrinos have a magnetic component to them, they will condense in these structures. And so you have, you, you've got the sound creating an assistance to the self-organization, and you have the magnets moving round, uh, also helping with the self-organization, because in the aluminium, it's forming these eddy currents. The eddy currents have a vortical center, so you have another means of aggregating these around the edge. And this produces a cluster that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You cannot see it. You cannot see it because it's moving material in the ether. It's a moving material in the ether. And so this produces a large torus, probably two tori, um, uh, depending on what you're doing. And this will produce a gravity shielding effect. Uh, it's, it's not... It's preventing the action of gravity on the structure that's inside this structure. But things that you approach these kind of things with will not work. Things like phones, watches, um, any kind of electronics, because they, they use um, uh, the Josephson effect, they use tunneling uh, for transistors to work. This, th this will not work. So electronics will not work ar around the technology that drives UFOs, okay? And it also messes with consciousness because our consciousness works with this uh, technology as well. Okay, so you will have difficulty having a normal strain of train of thought, and and your perception of time will be completely distorted because this is what causes time. Every random changing processes, the progression of time is counted in the change in the environment around you. If you don't have a change in the environment around you, time didn't happen. So if you remove the thing that causes time, then you can't perceive time. And if you remove the thing through which consciousness and, and, and connection to reality can uh, work, then you will not have uh, the ability to think in the same normal way that you do. Okay, so anyway, that was a, a little aside, but I'm talking about cymatics here, and I, I don't really need to go into it. There's, there's many different patterns you get, so it almost does not matter which sound you put in. But what I will say is if you have higher frequency sound, you have more nodes and antinodes. Okay, so you can even it out. Okay, so let's go back to here. So, uh, makes the charges via cavitation and resonant modes. So that's the resonant modes I'm talking about. Aggregates via resonant modes. Uh, so I'm talking about the fact that you have these magnetic structures. They are uh, uh, able to move to the area of least movement, which is the antinodes in, in your cymatics. And it stores aggregate particles. So once you've got them to a certain cluster size, they become attracted to anything paramagnetic. So, so in terms of a gas, oxygen is incredibly paramagnetic. Uh, it's bizarrely paramagnetic compared to all of the elements, all the way up to something like homium or something like that, um, of the paramagnetic element. And so this is why you've got those weird glows above Chernobyl. Uh, uh, because it changes the spectral bands, just as Xu and Zhu observed during three body alignments, because he has a different density of the relic neutrino condensate. Okay, so uh, stores the aggregates in metals, and we know we can store it in metals because you've seen it in S.V. Adamenko's work right there. And we know that uh, uh, Ken Shoulders says it can stay in metals indefinitely, and this is what was going on in Suhas Raukar's uh, reactor. Okay. So he then had a foil maker, and this was a fast, he, he only did this to produce a fast way to make nickel foil uh, for part of the electrode. And he pulsed water flow electrical discharge with 19.46 kilohertz sound, and uh, this would have assisted the formation and aggregation of these structures. Plasmoids were found in, and what I've got here is another slide uh, down here. 
Uh, and this is the work of Bogdanovich. And this is a black Taurus. This black Taurus here. This is so good at grabbing the light. So the uh, Evos can be spheres or tauri. Okay, this is a tauri. So the event horizon on this is, is real time. This, this is a plasma flow discharge by Bogdanovich at the Moscow uh, National Nuclear Physics Laboratory. So he has water flowing down here onto a metal plate and he's discharging high voltage through here and it's producing this plasmoid, which is, uh, you've got a plasma glow behind, but you, you can, you, it's not being able to get through the, the torus. So this is, this is an example of this going on. And actually, um, Suhas did this. And here is the uh, thing that produces his, um, uh, where are we? Am I doing, it's, it's, it's getting, there, there we go. So he has a metal plate in here uh, and he is got water with an electrolyte coming down and he's doing a discharge on that. And the metal plate uh, um, collects uh, nickel and it produces this nickel foil, which he actually uses ultrasonics to delaminate as well. And this goes into the reactor. So um, let, let me just find, oh dear. The fuel is processed in this. This is uh, PZT. And these are one and a half kilowatt horns. So you've got four and a half kilowatts of sound. And it goes into this central chamber where your powders. And all he was doing is he was trying to mill the powders to make them. So he's taking off the shelf powders that are not at five microns because they're expensive and they're not easy to get in India. But you can get powders of different scales. And the idea was to just mill them and put them in here with this sealed thing. And then he had a cooling channel and this outer chamber here was uh, for cooling because there's a lot of it. You've got four and a half kilowatts of energy going in here. So he was only trying to make it smaller. And the, the funny thing was, is when we looked at it under the SEM, um, uh, it, in almost every case, there were transmutation of elements. So this is the powder that's not, not processed, uh, not fully processed because he's not graded out the different scales. And we found different elements being synthesized in there, uh, like niobium and, and uh, zirconium that weren't in the original material and a lot of lead a lot of lead 57 percent lead 14 percent lead here 51 percent lead so why lead because it's the heaviest stable element in the periodic table so if you're doing this nuclear collapse and you're building and building and building elements uh you get to lead and if you go beyond lead it, it doesn't like to create radioactive elements so it comes back to lead so you end up building more lead and if you pushed it harder, you would start to produce things that, are, that, that were unpleasant. You don't want them. And that's what, what Adaminko did, and that's what Leclerc did. Okay. Uh, and here we've got, uh, what have we got? Again, more lead, uh, niobium, uh, and so forth. So uh, those are the sort of things that he was producing. On the foil, uh, we were getting things like uh, gold, 31% in this li little band area here. This is where the... Uh, plasmoid came in and collided with the metal and so we've got uh, gold here and palladium here um, and so we observed gold in the the first couple of slides with the work of Adamenko and here we've got it being produced uh, in a nickel system and um, we have uh, these other elements but also um, it produced uh, this structure which is a in my view with lots of other data that we've had since this is a collapsed, collapsed coherent traveling matter wave. Uh, and you can see the torus here. You can see the, the poloidal, uh, that you've got a toroidal motion here and you've got a poloidal motion here. So this is one part of the overall structure here. And this was uh, by weight 94.5% silver. There was no silver in this reactor. So this is one particular coherent matter traveling wave. Okay, so this is synthesizing elements. Now, what was he doing? Um, this is the actual uh, reactor to maybe uh, give you a better idea of what's going on. Is it going to do it? So you've got the metal going backwards and forwards. This is vibrated with your uh, uh, thing here. It has a discharge of 200 volts and it was at 300 kilohertz. Okay, so not only was he doing plasma flow discharge like the Moscow Nuclear Physics Laboratory producing those large plasmoids, uh, he was also using ultrasonics. Okay, and... Um, uh, then this foil and the powder goes into his reactor tubes here. And so the foil gets scrunched up into a ball. It's a very simple construction. Scrunched up into a ball. You have your powder here and you have uh, an ultrasonic horn, which is actually at one megahertz. 
okay? And then he has a tungsten thoriated electrode here. That's why, why do you have thori thorium? Um, because it lowers the work function. Uh, that is the ability for the electrode to emit electrons. Uh, and it penetrates, so the tip just comes through the nickel foil. So the, the nickel foil actually here is just to provide a conductor, a large size conductor, uh, to allow for uh, um, uh, corona discharge. And the tip of the tungsten uh, thoriated electrode is an initiator. Now, if he gets a spark between here and here, then the this ceramic tube blows up. Why? Well, I've already discussed this in many presentations, but when you have the material condensed into the electron condensate, uh, they, the, all the electrons, let's say there are 10 to the 23 electrons in a particular structure, which is much smaller than they would ordinarily be, then you blow this up by disrupting it with a, a, a discharge. The coherent electrons then return to their normal electron uh, uh, charge. So you've got, let's say, 10 trillion electrons, right? But they're all acting with one minus charge, okay? You disrupt it with an electrical discharge and it blows up. And at the point that it starts to dishevel, all of the individual electrons become a negative one charge. And then you have a columbic repulsion between all of them. And it's incredibly violent. And, and um, Ken Shoulders talked about how, uh, sadly, this can make unbelievable... Uh, weapons. Uh, he said about a 1cc um, of, of uh, fluidized electrons would do a 10 by 10 by 10 meter volume and basically everyone would be completely destroyed. So the point about what's going on in here is his metal has is completely loaded with these monopole structures. And what do you want to feed it? Well, you've got hydrogen atmosphere. Let's have a look at the overall reactor here. You've got eight of these cores around a central tube. You've got a, you've got a, a helical water it, uh, around the outside, and it comes through the center, and it comes out at, let's say, 95 degrees C. We, we, when we wanted to test this, we didn't want any phase change, okay? And so you have these multiple cores, and then this whole thing is in a hydrogen atmosphere. So it doesn't matter that you haven't sealed these things very well. It's not important, because you want the hydrogen in there as part of the fuel. Let's go back to here. Now, I'm going to actually show you on here a little bit more information so th th this is the uh, um, the generator working um, and it's it's producing steam there okay it's wet steam so there's a problem with that um, and is, is this where he gives me some fuel no 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 we can, you can go and have a look at this. This is on steamit.com uh, uh, at MFMP. And I, I describe in detail, but I, I have here the ultrasonic horn that connects to the reactor core. So it's a very simple construction. You have a ceramic tube here. You can imagine you've got your... Have I got the diagram here? No, I haven't got the diagram here. You, you've got the uh, uh, nickel foil, nickel foil through this tube you have uh, the welding electrode, welding electrode, and in the center here, you have that process powder. Inside that powder, it is completely loaded, chock full of, um, uh, of uh, these magnetic monopole structures, these exotic vacuum objects bound in the metal, like you saw at the beginning of the presentation in S.V. Adamenko's work. How do we know this? Well, because he gave us some fuel. He gave us some fuel, and I discovered uh, my first strange radiation looking at this in various different ways. Um, this was on this polymer that's on the outside. So I had a magnet here. We know these things can be affected by a magnet. So I had a magnet here, a little neodymium magnet, a neodymium magnet here. We had some neutron bubble detectors here, and this was left for a number of weeks. And we had these, um, whatever's coming out of this fuel, this is not graded and not sifted. So... He didn't know that this had strange radiation emitting from it. We discovered it by getting some of his fuel. And it came out and it was drawn into the direction of this magnet over here. And we've got this structure on here. And when we looked at it under an Olympus scanning laser microscope, we see the telltale signs of the impacts of strange radiation. There's one track here and these kind of double pits and, and group pits uh, of the kind of appropriate scale. 
One of the reasons I thought to use uh, a magnet in that way was the work of Keith Fredericks, who created these spots and observed these tracks. This is from Matsumoto, this star formation, and this is a similar uh, torus that's rolling along the surface, flipping over end to end, same as you've got here in Matsumoto's work. And he actually used a nuclear emulsion like Matsumoto, and he, because Ken Shoulders said that these things can be emitted from your fingertips, that's the easiest way to produce EVOs, he put his fingertips, so if you ever think of going om, producing sound, and sitting in the lotus position, creating a vortical structure around yourself from the evos that are being emitted from your fingers, then you know why people do that. I always used to think these people were utterly bonkers, but now I know they're not. <laughs> it's like the picture on your wall there, Tim. <laughs> um, so you're emitting these evos from your fingers, um, and uh, you've got left hand, right hand, which is exactly what you need. Uh, to produce the vortical structure around you. So he, you put his fingers on this film and used this neodymium magnet and produced these different traces. So um, uh, this is interacting with biology all of the time. Okay. So here is this uh, uh, thing here. Now um, I have... Uh, so I, I'm just going to step away to talk about um, the fall off of these structures and I've shared this slide with you before but what we've got going on here is we have two brass plates this is the cathode this is the anode this is causing electron bunching electron bunching leads to coherence of electrons that leads to coherent matter okay we then have the coherent matter the macro ball lightning forming here when it disrupts and explodes we have the emitting emission of part of the original structure of the coherent matter structure in the form of a coherent matter traveling wave and here if i press play you can see it flying out of there maybe i can you can see like so it goes boom and this coherent matter traveling wave comes out and recently using uh, computer animation software I've simulated how this works with toroids and, and so forth so um, we, we, we've observed all forms of strange radiation track uh, in three dimensions uh, using this type of uh, approach and here is a undiscussed strange radiation track uh, interacting with aluminium in work from the 1990s by Ken Shoulders. So this is where an Evo came through here by Ken Shoulders. This is a dual Evo. When I say dual, it's it's like a condensate of possible, uh, and I'll talk about this in a separate presentation, it's, it's possibly a singlet electron condensate where you have spin up, spin down, but it, like a massive, massive singlet state. Or it's a positron electron structure in a, in a, a massive coherent uh, um, uh, itonic cluster structure in the form of, of a, a, a thing that's much larger than a n normal positronium coming through. And this is why, because they have this magnetic link between them, um, they can spread apart and they come back together, just like a, a phallicosoliton does in the swimming pool. But down in this bottom side, uh, part here, you have this type of strange radiation track where the helical structure of the coherent matter traveling wave is traveling through. And because the binding energy of the electrons and the ions in this coherent matter traveling wave structure is far uh, higher than normal ordinary matter. Uh, normal ordinary matter has no way of being able to uh, uh, resist this. And this is why it makes unbelievably unpleasant weapons. This is why the Hutchison effect did really, really weird stuff um, because ordinary matter cannot deal with this. Okay, so uh, so this is what I'm talking about. This structure here has a very defined boundary. And when it goes through this aluminium, which is a highly thermally conductive metal, it's literally cutting it exactly the same shape as the coherent matter traveling wave. Okay, it's not spending long in here, but it's completely removing the material. This is what I'm talking about with an event horizon. Uh, outside of it, it's largely unaffected. Inside of it, it's completely changed. Now, in this particular video, which I've analyzed in detail, this is uh, about five frames within one of our Vega experiments. This is done in Canada by David Boutlier. Uh, and uh, you can see several coherent matter traveling wave structures going around. This one here is beautiful because you've got the, the, the pos positive and negative structure orbiting around each other. Um, 
but we've got one that comes up here. It orbits around this one before it even gets there, and it comes over here, and this one comes up here, and it's orbiting around here. This one comes around and bends around, and then this orbits in the other direction. But they, they're not really interested in where the anode and the cathode are. They're only interested if they come within a certain distance of each other. They literally have, they go in exactly the direction they want to go in until they see, look ahead or look behind the structure of another one of these coherent matter traveling waves, in which case they move very, very intensely. And one presentation where this is very, very clear, uh, maybe not so clear, but you, you'll have the slides, uh, is this one, which is a sequence of frames where we've got a large uh, plasmoid structure in the reactor. But we have this one that comes out it comes out here, it goes over to the left, it goes over to the left, it bounces off the cathode, it gets re-energized, comes round to the right now, comes round to the right, comes round to the right, and then another one is blowing out of the, the birthing zone over here, and it comes in, and it's, it's doing its own trajectory, and then in one frame, one sixtieth of a second frame, it becomes in, it starts to come orbiting around the, the one that's just come round from the side. So it has no influence, it has no influence, and then it has all the influence in the world. And then you see another one here in purple coming out, it's moving in its own direction, and then it, it starts to interact with the two that are now nearly perfectly in sync. They're self-cohering, they are self-organising coherent matter travelling waves, okay? And there's no resonant chamber in here, they're just doing it because they're so influential on each other. And this one comes in and it starts to wrap around this one, and it's wrap around, and then these three come together. But for whatever reason, these these two may have performed a, a decent stable structure. But by the time it gets to here, this one has disrupted them, and they kind of wobble out, and they go on their own merry ways. But another one down here bounces off the bottom, and then it comes up, and it <laughs> it's hilarious. It comes to here, and then it orbits 180 degrees only around this one's path, and then it starts to follow it. So the influence on each other is phenomenal. The ability and desire for them to collect and, and organise, but they're organising at a distance. And this is what Ken Shoulders observed. They form bead chains. Matsumoto observed this as well. We have observed this. Many authors have observed this. And in fact, even if you go back to the original work uh, of um, that was a reference for uh, Ken Shoulders, this is the uh, Lafferty book here, um, there is a book in this, uh, a page in this book, uh, where um, they actually characterised where, where cathode spots produce these um, structures. And this is probably way back in the 60s or 70s. And they produce these par parameterised uh, um, groupings. So you have one on its own, and then you have two that are all between three, which are equidistant, uh, 120 degrees, and so forth. And so you can imagine that's like a collision of one of these self-organised structures with the surface. But within them, they have their own substructure, which I've discussed in other presentations. OK, so why, why am I talking about this? It's, it's about this aggregation process. And uh, just for some fine detail, this is from um, uh, uh, Zhigilov, Vladislav Zhigilov. And he looked at one of these birdies that he produced in a laser, using a laser, which was suggested by Lowe in 1973 as a way to cohere matter. You actually use coherent light to cohere other matter. This was suggested in 1973. Uh, he used laser into uh, um, water that had been exposed to sunlight with, uh, or being outside uh, with 0.4 Tesla magnets underneath it for about 10 days. This actually allows the relic neutrinos to, um, uh, in my view, aggregate into the oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So the oxygen's paramagnetic. The cooler oxygen is, the more paramagnetic it is. That's why if you have liquid oxygen, it, it stays between the, pa the poles of two magnets, okay? So uh, the cooler it is, the much more paramagnetic it is. But let's say it's just paramagnetic in the water. You've got the relic neutrinos coming down and you've got the magnets underneath. Now, here's the thing. If ancient people took a, um, a, a mag magnetite bowl and they put water in it and they put it into the sunshine, that water would be very, very materially different after a period of time because the oxygen dissolved in the water would be replete with clusters of magnetic monopoles. All water is not the same. 
It's absolutely not the same. Cavitation, running down a stream, crashing against a shore, working its way through cracks in, in, uh, from underground, whether it's volcanic or pressure related through rainfall and so forth and springs. Any cavitation was synthesized through cavitation, through this process, fresh bioavailable elements. This is why life likes to live near streams, likes to live near the sea. It doesn't like to drink someone else's water, ideally. <laughs> <laughs> because biology would absorb this stuff. But water exposed to the sun in a Petri dish, in a sealed vial, and, and then um, uh, exposed to a laser produces these structures on film. And when you look at the arc, the, the outside of these structures, they've got a clear substructure to them. There's su substructures within there. And I believe these are also similar to the macro structure. This is an aggregate of aggregates of aggregates of aggregates of aggregates of aggregates of aggregates. Okay, and these things can scale. And the north, the pseudo north monopoles like to join the pseudo north monopoles, and the pseudo south monopoles like to join the pseudo south monopoles. What do I mean by that? If you can imagine this is a mushroom, okay, this is like a primer fields bowl, or more specifically, like the Boyd Bushman. Uh, uh, directional uh, magnetic beam pattern by Lockheed Martin, which when he was working at like, Lockheed Martin. And it produces a magnetic beam of either south or north energy, depending on the arrangement of the magnets around the other uh, six, uh, other five sides of, a, of, a, of a, a, um, a cube in the basic configuration. But this is more like a primer fields bowl where you've got lots of magnetic monopole structures or, or uh, things that have a magnetic beam pointing into a cone, into a direction which produces an intense magnetic beam. And the, the, this intense magnetic beam here in my view, is the disruption beam, is the disruption beam in the Podlikstanov work, which causes material to blend into other materials in the same fashion as the John Hutchison work. So, like I say, spinning bodies will produce these things. Electrical discharge will produce these things. Cavitation will produce these things. Okay, so lastly, I have my steam room. So this is me earlier today in the steam room in my city here in Brno. And I'm going to use a phrase here as I drink my fake Soviet cola here because they didn't get Coca-Cola over here. So they invented this thing called Kefola. <laughs> Do you bring Mohammed to the mountain or the mountain to Mohammed? In the case of S.V. Adamenko, he was bringing the, the Mohammed to the mountain, i.e. he was taking the thing that needed to be cohered and, and can, transformed to the mountain, which was in the accretion plate in his experiments. Okay, That's not going anywhere. It's stuck there in the landscape of the accretion plate, and he's shooting the ions into it. It's kind of like the, the realize, realization I had was... What is so important in Suhas Ralkar's technology that he has to have this uh, ultrasonics here moving these particles around, okay? And then you've got a corona discharge, okay? Well, what is a corona discharge? Well, you've got ions and electrons forming, okay? What did I say these structures need? They need ions and electrons. This is exactly proven, 100% with all certainty you can possibly imagine, by the claim of S.V. Adamenko in that accretion disk. They feed on ions and electrons. Okay? Shoulders said, what do you do to keep an exotic vacuum object alive? You feed it electrons. Okay? All right. And if you don't feed it enough electrons, they die. But they will reside indefinitely in metals. He has metal powders in here with absolutely replete with these structures. We know because for two or three months afterwards, we saw it shredding polymer and we caught them on a web camera, the one that I'm looking to you on now. <laughs> and in fact, I can show you that. We're ne nearly at the end. You'll probably be pleased to know um, uh, in a different thing. So that's, this is a side view. So you've got the, the ultrasonic horns and the reactors here, the water on the outside, the water on the inside. So this is what his fuel did to a plastic container after just a few days. He says, Bob, I don't know why, but I put my, my unprocessed fuel into a container and it just it shreds them to pieces. 
And uh, he, he literally lifted this one that was on the shelf behind him off the shelf. And as he moved it around, the whole thing just fell apart. It wasn't in this state when he started to hand it to me. It was quite funny. <laughs> um, so then I, I decided, to, I thought, well, okay, maybe that's, that's producing some strange radiation. So may, maybe we should look at it. Uh, and so um, you can see this macro photography. So these are the stars of Matsumoto. And what these are showing, and you've, you've got the helical, sorry, the, the, the uh, toroid running over each other. It produces like these like train tracks. And here, here's a star and the, 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 the structure's coming up. This, this is a blowing up macro cluster that's here, blowing up macro cluster, blowing up macro cluster here. And it, it shreds these two lines side by side. It's literally shredding the polymer. Um, there's some closer, different macro. Here's some, here's some nice shots here. There's the train tracks here. So you can go and have a look at this. So this is this little container here. It, it literally, it, it was so destructive. And the, the, the in energy in these things. And I, I don't know, I think, I think um, uh, S.V. Adamenko found these were large numbers of giga electron volts, each one of these structures. So I then used Cosmic Ray Finder and I had, I put PTFE here. This was because it was just something to cut out the light. And little did I know and later find out that fluorine and carbon are good fuel for straight for strange radiation, i.e. Uh, 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 exotic vacuum objects in dark mode. And so you had them coming out here. They were excited by this uh, PTFE tape and they came into the structure. And uh, I think uh, we, we have a number of traces there, but they're not the best. So we'll go to the next one which is up here. I changed the orientation so it was more flat on, so it had a longer run through it, and it shifted over time to here. And uh, this is my favorite trace. And the, the reason this is my favorite trace because it exactly lines up with one that was found in um, uh, the first lion that we looked at, the first lion reactor, the, the actual geometry of the trace. And th this this shows the, the structure of where it's moving. And so th this, was, uh, this was determined from the pixel size on the detector and so this is not three body interactions this is not a, a piece of grit between two things making a trace as it rolls around this is something that came out of that reactor out of that fuel after a, a, an exotic vacuum object destabilized and blew up a macro cluster and a fragment came out it went through the polymer it went through the air it went through another piece of polymer it went through the air it went through many layers of ptfe it went through the plastic on the front through the ir filter uh, through the lens and into the ccd leaving this track this is incredibly energetic and it must be neutral and this is it overlaid onto the lion track here at same scale and i actually I, I, interestingly i didn't have to rotate the actual track <laughs> So uh, it's, it's, you've got the monopole structures here, but you've actually got the excitation of the CCD. Okay, so why am I... Uh, uh, so we know 100% that it was emitting strange radiation. In fact, we, we observed it on x-rays and, and so forth. But I think observing it using a CCD is, is probably the most I interesting of the findings. So back to our thing here. So why was he using ultrasonics? Or why did it work? Well, it's a case of he can't, he needs to feed these things with as much of ions and electrons as possible. And in the reactor, he has absolute buckets of ions and uh, electrons because he has this corona discharge here. Okay? But what we have shown is that there is this incredible event horizon where everything happens when you cross the event horizon everything happens when you cross the event horizon everything happens when you cross the event horizon everything happens when you are crossing and going to the event horizon so rather than shooting ions into the center by having this vibrate you're moving the particles which are all over the surface covered with these, what look like, if you were to look, be able to see them, they look like solar prominences. You have a, a one pole and another pole, and you have material that's sweeping through in an intense magnetic flux loop. Okay, And that magnetic flux loop will grab the electrons and ions and produce energy by fusing or fissioning them appropriately 
to or from uh, to from heavy elements to light elements or from light elements to middle of the road elements uh, somewhere between iron and calcium they tend to end up and so I was sitting in this um, steam room about four four years ago and I I sat there and I, I'm you know when you're sitting in a steam room nothing it, it, you kind of you're getting hot and you're getting hot over a period of time and that's called brownian motion so that's like our particles sitting at the bottom of an echo reactor not moving okay they're only getting the electrons and the ions that are getting there by statistical chance of particle interactions through brownian motion and going on in the Ad adamenko experiment even less is occurring because they're only going to get the ions if they're directly fired at the black spot. But if we then vibrate my hand as I did a couple of years ago like that, what you find is, and you can go and experiment with this yourself to have a very visceral connection with what's going on, your hand gets a lot hotter because you are you're all these water molecules in the air that had a lot higher energy then the temperature of your hand collide with your hand and they share the energy. But what that taught me is I am adding more of these molecules to my hand. And this is what's happening. It's like wind chill factor. It is like being on a motorbike with a helmet off and going on an icy road. If you stand on the motorbike, you're pretty okay. You've got hairs on your face and stuff, right? You're not so cold. But if you get on the motorbike and you go at 70 miles an hour, believe me, your face starts to freeze pretty darn quickly. Okay, this is what's going on in the reactor. So you need to make these structures. Uh, and in, in conclusion, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna kill my uh, presentation here. Okay, so can you see my mugshot, my ugly mugshot? <laughs> okay. Okay, fine. Okay, so, so um, you need to make these structures. Like, like on this uh, uh, Hutchison sample here, you will have. The structures growing on the grain boundaries, as we have now proven in our Vega experiments last year, uh, and is, we can observe it on Hutchison samples, and they build up on the grain boundaries in aluminium, because aluminium has all these grain boundaries. In iron, if you can get them to build up inside the material, they will produce intense magnetic monopoles, because they lock. In, in, in aluminium, they can move around and jiggle. So you'll get one moving, growing here and another one growing here, but they get too big enough. And if they're the same pole, they'll come together. So it goes, blah, 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 right? But iron is ferromagnetic, okay? So as you get the building and you're building, they become, they stay locked in place and they're locked so hard to the iron that they, the new ones that are formed jump onto each other. So you get an aggregation of norths and souths bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until if if you have two norths that are growing and growing and growing they will then literally tear the sample apart it literally goes <laughs> because you're an intense north and an intense north so you end up with a sample that has two norths okay now when when um george hathaway was talking about all of these different systems producing the same effect and probably it was john uh, knowing you know, having some interaction with it there's two things that he's saying which are correct yes if you are electrically static uh, sensitive as I am I, I can predict when there's going to be lightning almost every time right some people can do that some people can't right there's there's an, a certain level of field that you can sense then you will know better when it's going to occur but he also used an AM radio and in the previous presentation, I showed you that when you get an electron macrocluster disheveled and the uh, electrons that were formerly in a condensate state blow up, they then return to the state of normal electrons. They form a columbic repulsion, which is instantaneous, and that produces a scalar wave. That gets picked up on AM waves as broadband AM, and get, it gives you the pop. So he used two tri tri tricks. He used the fact that he's sensitive to electrostatics, and he used the fact that he's listening for those pops. And it doesn't happen immediately. You have to have patience. Because if you haven't got things set up, you will not get the clusters forming very quickly. If you haven't got the parameters right, they will not form pr quickly. He had a high intensity discharge xenon tube. That is absolutely perfect for producing loads and loads of these 
buy the bucket load and you guide them to the sample area. They aggregate in the sample area. But he also sometimes used uh, traveling waveguides and he also used sometimes some, some um, um, uh, uranite, as I said. It was always in, in, in presence. Uranite by itself will be producing these things, right? And you need to aggregate them and guide them to the, the active area. Once they are there at a sufficient intensity, they will lock into place. With aluminium, they move around, like I said, on the crystal boundaries. And in iron, they tend to stay in place and grow in, the, in situ. Okay, And you could use sound, actually, to improve it. And I've talked about how you would use sound. And I talked about this before the Salvatore Pi patterns were released. That you would use a technique that was developed in the 1950s to use a piezo material to convert high frequency mag magnetron output say 10 mega gigacycles or whatever they call it it's like 10 10 gigahertz or whatever it's are and and you convert that into solitons of of uh, traveling waves scalar waves which are just actual phonons that are of the same um same uh distance as the interatomic spacing and this is specifically said in new scientist in 1963 this is not patentable okay sorry Sorry, Salvatore Pi and the U US Navy. This is not patentable. And what this does is it causes these structures, these electron condensates, to, to grow in situ. And when they join each other, as we have shown in Vega, they wet together. And that produces superconductivity through the structure. And this is specifically said in uh, the book, which you can download off remoteview.icu by Takaaki Matsumoto. And he said this in 1999, okay? And he said the structures, and we have demonstrated it in a huge scale using the, um, the Vega Valley. And so you have one ball lightning here, and one ball lightning here, and one ball lightning here, and they are wetting their electron condensate uh, north-south uh, magnetic monopole structures, uh, pseudo-monopole structures together. And uh, when they are uh, big enough, they wet together, and this is one condensate. This is one electron fluid condensate, okay? And I, I will be producing a book of that. That is actually a five millimeter by seven millimeter segment from the, the, the thing. It's the most incredible uh, um, demonstration of what uh, self-organized plasma can create in other matter by and, and showing how the magnetic and nuclear uh, transmutations and everything is al al aligning up. But anyway. But my point being is that um, you can create superconductivity in the metals and then once you get superconductivity you have some very very weird effects going on like things become transparent okay and I, I gave an example I think back in 2017 maybe I can quickly find the presentation if I don't do something very silly here um, okay I'm, I'm pretty much done I, well, I, I I don't mind taking questions. I, I just I just want to share this this particular thing. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let me just see if I've got the right one here. What what was my thread? What was I talking about? <laughs> no, no, I've lost my thread. Oh yes, yes. Okay. Uh, oh no, it's actually okay. I'm normally up late. <laughs> um, so uh, this is this is an, uh, from an old presentation, but it's got some useful slides. So let me just switch back to show you my share. So I think I gave this presentation. Uh, so what are you seeing now? I don't know whether you're seeing. What are you seeing? Okay, good. Let's go here then. <laughs> right, and let's find the slide I want to show you. So th this is the bead chains by um, shoulders. Uh, what I'm talking about is this famous experiment. Uh, uh, by Thunderfoot, where he mixes sodium and potassium in water. And so you have your silvery metallic thing. It becomes black uh, as it interacts with the water, and then it becomes transparent. Now, I believe that this is because 
you have a, an electron condensate or an intense amount of electrons that are in connecting the, interconnecting their wave functions in here and it's interacting with light in a very materially different way. And then it explodes and the explanation for the explosion is a columbic explosion, although this is an ionic columbic explosion rather than a pure electron columbic explosion. But this isn't exactly what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is, is that... Um, if you have this going on in the metals, the metals may actually become transparent, okay? So you, if you had an anti-gravity craft that was using this technology, there's two things that you might, well, a number of things. I talked about the fact that it's likely that they will have plasma and the plasma will grow through several um, colors uh, from sort of the ionization of nitrogen in the air and oxygen, and then it will go through to... Uh, uh, UV, so it'll blue shift, it'll blue shift, uh, it'll go, sorry, it'll go sort of like purple through to yellow, the, uh, this is my prediction off the top of my head, it would go to a UV blue type look, and then it will start to look transparent, and there's two reasons for that, once when it's a coherent condensate, the light from behind will bend around the entire structure, like, like it does around a black hole, and the other, the other thing is the actual metals in there, if they're depending on their metals, uh, will become partially transparent. So you might even be able to see into the craft partially um, because of the way that the, the technology works. Um, so uh, th this is the transparency thing. So uh, let me go back to uh, the previous presentation. So um, and there we go here. So uh, I hope what I've given you food for thought is that when... when uh, uh, George Hathaway is saying he doesn't know because loads of different systems produced it. Over nine years, Shishkin et al. in, in Dubna, in Science City, 50 kilometers north of Moscow, found that very many systems produce these re, uh, relic neutrino condensates, which can start off as electron condensates carrying ions, but they carry ions definitely. And when they interact with materials, they, they act as if they have uh, neutrinos in them. Okay, they are neutral because they're coming through the water, they're coming through the aluminium, they're traveling over air, and they're in going through the sheath of the uh, uh, radio uh, plate, uh, the, the emulsion, and they are interacting with the uh, um, silver uh, uh, compound on, on the nuclear emulsion. And so, um, uh, you, you can imagine how um, these things are clustering, and they can cluster and be produced by a range of things. The, 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 the simplest way that you can do this and, and to do nuclear transmutation is to go and buy yourself an ultrasonic, probably around about 43 kilohertz uh, domestic cleaner. Um, they're about, uh, I don't know, the size of a toaster and they cost about $35. You can get aluminium kitchen foil and uh, high quality uh, uh, or any water, but it's useful to have deionized water. You put it on the underside of a... Um, a cake box from an old CD stack and uh, you uh, sonicate it for about uh, three minutes and you find these yin-yang pairs and in the center of the yin-yang pairs where the forces are most intense you get the synthesis of the elements and you will see that you have coherent matter frozen coherent matter traveling waves on other areas of the aluminium as well it's the simplest way there's a long history with people like uh, uh, um, uh, Roger Stringham of synthesizing elements using ultrasonics uh, so uh, and the higher the frequency the more resonant nodes you have so uh, Suhas Ralka in a reactor was having one uh, uh, megahertz so not only the particles lofted into this iron and electron rich food for the uh, magnetic monopole flux loops um, the the organization in the whole system is is, is much more superior as well OK, and uh, and so forth. So this is you in a strong wind or this is you on a motorbike running into the uh, driving into the wind or, as I said, vibrations in a steam room.